Thank you everybody for coming out tonight to our next edition of our guest speaker series. Uh, this is something we've been doing now for five years and it's nice to do it back in person after a year and a half without it. So thank you all for coming back out. So tonight we have a returning performer, Ms. Lorna Zarnota over here. This is her third time, second time in person though. She was kind enough to do one virtually for us as well. Uh, and tonight she's going to talk about the other side of Wicked Niagara, um, something I think she talked about before, but she's going to give us a little bit more. And then all this comes from uh, a book she wrote that we actually have in the gift shop, wink wink. Um, and we have a couple of her other titles as well. Uh, she's written several books on uh, the western New York area and local history and, and folklore and such. So. Uh, but uh, before I turn it over, I just want to thank uh, GoArt for granting us a uh, grant which helps fund this program. So I want to thank you to them for that. And uh, with that, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me back at the Holland Land office. I'm very happy to be here. The first time I was here, I told stories from my book, Legends, Lore, and Secrets of Western New York, oh, okay. um, which was filled with all of the stories that <clears throat> I wanted people to know, all of the creative, courageous, invention, inventive things that came out of Western New York, that we were more than just a blizzard, <laughs> <laughs> and that we were not upstate New York. I mean, that, was, that was a major goal for that book. Thank you. <clears throat> and the second time I uh, did a program, and I think that was the virtual one, was Native American and Pioneer Sites of Upstate New York. But that's not the title I gave it. That's the title that my publisher wanted. My title was The History of Routes 5 and 20 from Albany to Buffalo. Oh. But my publisher said, nobody will know where that is. Obviously, she wasn't from Western New York. <laughs> and tonight, <coughs> excuse me, tonight I'm here to tell you stories from Wicked Niagara, the sinister side of the Niagara frontier. But you look like very kind people. And so before I begin, I, you know, I've been telling stories for over 30 years. And I know that the stage is not a place to air your personal problems. But I have to share something very disturbing with you. So I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth. And I've not always been a storyteller and an author. But in the 70s, I came into some money. I had a mansion. Well, actually, it was a new build in Williamsville. But it was a mansion to me because it was much bigger than the home I live in now. I had a sports car, a motorcycle, and I had a man. Mm. He was gorgeous. The most handsome man you have ever seen. His name was Jeremy. And we got married. And everything was wonderful for a while. But he had a roving eye. And one night he went out to a discotheque, you remember those. And he met another woman, and Jeremy never came home. I was served with divorce papers. He took my house, he took my motorcycle, he took the sports car, he took the dog. He took everything except the little nest egg I had hidden away in cash and couldn't find out. And I used that to follow him and his new sweetie. Do you know what they did with my money? They bought a yacht. They bought a yacht. And they sailed down to the Caribbean and the Bahamas. And then they went into the South Sea and they went to Hawaii. They went to Tahiti, Bora Bora. I followed them everywhere. <laughs> and when I got to Hawaii, I came this close to being able to put my hands around Jeremy's neck and squeeze. <laughs> but that's as close as I got. And then I lost track of them. I do know that they sold the yacht and went on a cruise to Europe. I came back to Buffalo. Well, I had just about had it. All these years, no word, no sign, gone. 
and I was despondent. So I went to that little body of water north of Buffalo, where a lot of people go who are despondent. And I stood there at the brink of the water, and I let it pull me. And that's when I saw him, Jeremy, much older. And he had the audacity to marry a young girl. <laughs> and they were honeymooning, honeymooning in oh, Niagara the Falls. Ones? In Niagara Falls. To the third girlfriend? I don't know. Oh. But I could have strangled him. <laughs> Slowly, Slowly I turn, turn. <laughs> step by step, <laughs> inch by inch, I grabbed Jeremy by the throat and I shook him. I slapped him on one side, I slapped him on the other, I need him, you know where. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I should not do that to it's you. Okay. I shouldn't tell you these terrible stories. You know, it's just that when I hear those two words, Niagara Falls. Oh. Slowly I turn, step by step, inch by inch. This is an old vaudeville act from the 30s. It was done in a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. um, the Three Stooges did it, uh, Evan Costello yes. did it, and they did it with a lot of different guest stars. I saw one where they had done it with Errol Flynn, um, and uh, Emma Jean Coca, and I forget, I forget the actor's name, he had a, a comedy show, and they did it in a slightly different version where uh, she was going to jump off the Empire State Building. So this, uh, this was a very popular sinister story <laughs> and it certainly um, doesn't play out in a lot of audiences these days but you know about the story so you were prepared <laughs> and i hope i didn't wear you there never was a jeremy i never had a mansion i never rode a motorcycle or had a sports car it's all a lie but uh, but the act is real <laughs> So that brings me to a story I want to tell you tonight. And you know, I, before I do that, though, I want to talk about exactly why Wicked. It's not the story I wanted to tell. I told that in Legends, Lore, and Secrets of Western New York. But when your publisher calls you and says, do you think you could write a book for our Wicked series? Um, it's really hard to say no. So I set off, I set out to uh, I thought, well, Wicked, you know, it has to be murders, ghost stories. And so I was going to do that. And I found out that there were already books with collections of ghost stories from the re region. And I only knew one, and that was about the headless soldier at Fort Niagara. So that wouldn't make a book. But as I was doing my research, I kept coming up with these tiny little snippets of events. They weren't stories until I researched the history around them, which is what I like to do. So it's not just a lot of strange stories, but it's the history leading up to those stories that interests me. Um, but why, why is it so, you know, there a sinister side? Well, once I wrote the book, I realized you can't have the light without the dark. They, they bookend each other. So, in a way, Wicked Niagara and Legends, Lore, and Secrets of Western New York are uh, partner books. They're, they're a set. Um, so if you get one, take a look at the other. If you like it, you know. Um, at any rate, so this was a gateway. Buffalo and Western New York was, was a gateway region. And it still is today. I'd hate to say this, but I think this is true. Few people come to Buffalo to come to Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Most people are on their way somewhere else. Yeah. They're heading to Niagara Falls. They're going to Canada. They're going to Michigan by way of Canada. They're going to Pennsylvania, Ohio. But few people come to Buffalo for, you know, just to come, hey, let's go on a vacation, let's go to Buffalo. Not very many people say that, right? 
So there are other draws here. And I think that if we focus on bringing people here who are going somewhere else and getting them to stay here and look at what we have, that is a, a good goal mm -hmm. because we do have a lot to offer. Um, but if you think of Buffalo, it is the second largest city in New York, in New York State, the first being New York City. And just like my books, they're bookends, right? At either end of the state. And if we were to tip the state like this, everything in New York City would trickle down into Buffalo. And that's kind of how it is. We have two Great Lakes. We have the river. We are the western terminus of the Erie Canal. Thank goodness they made us the western terminus of the Erie Canal. And before there were automobiles and before there were trains and long before there were airplanes, waterway was the easiest mode of transportation. So most people traveled <coughs> on those waterways. And uh, we had a lot of immigration. Some immigrants came from Europe and they stayed in New York City and they didn't leave there because there was work. And then, uh, you know, before, before the American Revolution, everything west of Albany was wilderness. So there was nothing to bring people there. But once west, westward expansion began, um, those people started to move westward in our direction. Um, and when the Erie Canal was built, that did bring people to Buffalo for the purpose of work, and they settled there. And we have quite a mix of people. Uh, there was a large Irish population, and they were sort of uh, uh, taken over by the Italian population, and the German population, and the Polish population, and just a mix of people and ideas. And when you have diversity, you have the potential for conflict. It's a simple truth. Different ideas don't always mix. Some are like oil and water. So that's why we have wicked Niagara. Um, while we're up in Niagara Falls, while we're in Niagara Falls, I don't want to go through that whole routine. <laughs> I want to share with you one of my favorite stories from this, uh, from this book. So, the front is on the Canadian side of the falls. It's that area that has all of the attractions. It's known as the front. And the first museum in Canada was built at Table Rock on the front. It was built by Thomas Barnett. Uh, Thomas Barnett, I'd like to think of him as a bit of a visionary because he was one of the first businesses to build there. He somehow knew that Niagara Falls would be a, a draw for people from all around the world, um, even though it may not be the honeymoon capital of the world any longer. It certainly is still one of the natural wonders of the world and people come to view it. And that water is a, is a living thing, you know, it just pulls you. And you, you can't help but stand there and feel the living water of Niagara Falls. Well, Thomas Barnett realized this, and he was an expert taxidermist. He had quite a large collection of animals that he had taxidermied. And he wanted some place to put them. So he bought an old brewery and turned that brewery into a museum. And he was a collector. He was a serious collector. Um, he was not as interested in making money as he was in educating people. This was the age we call the age of, of spectacle. It was a time when paintings went on tour, and I'm going to talk about one of those in a little while. And people who were not educated necessarily in schools and colleges were educated by viewing all of these spectacular exhibits. 
They paid pennies to do so, and then that caused conversations and gave people things to talk about. Many libraries had cases with seashells and uh, rocks and other things from around the world. It was a time before, and we're talking the mid to late 1800s, before automobiles, so how could you travel to, Grand, uh, to the Grand Canyon and, and see it and see the native people of the plains and the deserts and all of those wonders if you didn't have the money to take a train or to take a ship to Europe or wherever it might be. And most people didn't have the money, you know, the average person, and they didn't have the time because that mode of transportation, I mean, thank goodness we can get in a plane and be there today, right? You know, in a matter of hours. But, um, to get on a ship and go to Europe, I think that was a month. How many people could take off from work and do that? They leave their families behind and do that. So people like Thomas Barnett, they collected all of these wonders and put them on display. So he really wanted a classy museum that was educational and could attract not only the wealthy people, but families with children, and they could see all of these wonders. He had assembled quite a few Native American artifacts, um, and also bought some artifacts from the Pan Am, uh, Pan Am exhibition. Mm -hmm. uh, he, his son Sidney, went to Egypt four separate times and brought back Egyptian artifacts, including mummies which were on display in his museum. The Table Rock Museum is what it was called. Uh, when they discovered mastodons in Toronto area, he had a mastodon, he had a humpback whale. It was like a mini Smithsonian, you know, uh, right in Niagara Falls across the border in Canada. So that's pretty spectacular. I love that story. But for all of his seriousness, this is wicked Niagara. And there has to be another side to the story. Enter Saul Davis. Saul Davis was not interested in educating people. He was interested in money. He was a huckster, a scammer. He was the kind of guy who would sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, if you know what I mean. And he built a hotel called Prospect House, right across from the Table Rock Museum. And later built another hotel. And these two men, both of them, moved, like the museum moved to a few different locations. At one point, Thomas Barnett hired an architect from Europe to design a museum for him up there at the Falls. Um, so, they, they moved around and they built several different businesses. One point, Saul Davis's business got the nickname Den of Forty Thieves mm. because it was known for robbery, gambling, prostitution, cheating, stealing, lying, you name it, that was Saul Davis's M.O. It got so bad that the two men came head to head. You can imagine how it was for Thomas Barnett, who wanted to attract good people and families, and he had to put up with all of this next door, basically, you know. And at one point, uh, Saul Davis got to the point where he was sending his henchmen, as he called them, to stand out in front of the museum and draw customers away when they tried to go inside. You don't want to go there, come on over and see what we have. At one point a gun was involved, somebody got shot. Um, it was, it was a, a big rivalry between the two men. One man who was interested in money and the other who was interested in doing something decent. And Saul Davis was not against trying any trickery whatsoever. There were staircases uh, before the museum was built and all of that. People used to go down 
into the gorge. It was not safe necessarily to go down closer to the water. Um, where the lift is today at, at, um, on that side of the falls that takes you down, I think to the Cave of the Winds or mm -hmm. something like that, that lift, that is where a staircase was built so that people could go down the stairs and be near the water. And these two men vied for the leases to those stairs. So one time Thomas Barnett held the lease, somehow Saul Davis got his hands on it. And when Saul Davis had the lease to the stairs, it had to be free for the use of people to go down and look at the water. He charged people to come back up. Um, oh. You need to take a raincoat. You really need to take a raincoat because you're going to get wet down there. No, I know you don't want a raincoat, but I really want you to take this raincoat. Okay. Take it. Go down. You'll be fine. You won't get wet. This was Saul Davis. Okay. How much did you charge for the raincoat? It was free. Until, until, until I tried to get it back. Oh, okay. Oh, uh -huh. So when you took it back to the counter to turn it in, then you got the bill. Oh, oh, I just walk out the door. <laughs> Not if Saul Davis's henchmen were waiting at the door for you. And that's the kind of man Saul Davis was. Well, poor, poor Thomas Barnett. He tried so hard to make a go of his business there. He really did. Um, but, you know, between the bitterness and the one turning the other into the police and being taken to court and sued and fined and everything else, um, it just wasn't working. And Thomas Barnett's business was dropping off. So in 1872, he had an idea. He said to himself, self? It's very popular to have Wild West shows now. People like to go to Wild West shows. So up here in Canada on the, on the brink of the Niagara, I'm going to hold a Wild West show. It's not the West, but that's okay. I'm going to hold a Wild West show. And he tried to get um, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, but he had to settle for Bill Hickok. Mm -hmm. Still not bad, mm -hmm. not bad, but Bill Hickok didn't have as big a draw. He called his extravaganza, his Wild West show, the Great Buffalo Hunt. And they were going to kill live animals. Mm -hmm. Of course. Mm -hmm. The Indians that were supposed to show up were not allowed to leave the reservation. A lot of the animals died before the show even started. So instead of the 10,000 or more people who he was ex that he was expecting to attend, he had about 3,000. And he lost a lot of money. Five years later, Thomas Barnett went bankrupt. He lost his money. And he had to put the museum and all its contents now think about that. This, this was his life. This meant so much to him. He had to put it all up for auction. Mm. Saul Davis bought it. Ouch. Saul Davis bought <clears throat> Thomas Barnett's life. Ooh. He bought the museum and its contents. Some of the contents were eventually sold to P.T. Barnum. Um, Saul Davis had to move his museum to the, Ameri to a, the American side of the falls at one point. I believe it went back to the Canadian falls. A lot of problems. He had a zoological display. And people complained, the neighbors in the neighborhood complained about the smell and the sound of the animals. So he had to close the zoological display. And eventually Saul Davis went out of business too. And those artifacts were spread all over the place. Like I said, P.T. Barnum bought some, and a collector in Toronto got quite a few. The collector in Toronto thought that he recognized one of the mummies from Thomas Barnett's collection. And after doing some exploring, 
he discovered that that mummy that had been kept in a museum, probably gathering dust, in Niagara Falls was none other than King Ramses the First. In 2003, the mummy was returned to Egypt. So think about it. Thomas Barnett built what could have been a spectacular Smithsonian type museum. But he somehow Saul Davis walked into his life and made him miserable. Then when he lost everything, the Indians couldn't come. He couldn't get the man he wanted for the Wild West show. The animals died before they could do it. Nobody came. He lost everything, and his arch enemy bought his business. Maybe it was the curse of the mummy. Mm -hmm. And that's wicked. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. <laughs> now I'm going to back up to the beginning. You know, great minds sometimes. This morning, I, I wasn't sure. This is not where I was going to go. I wasn't going to start out the way I did, but I said, hey, instead of starting at the beginning, let's start in the middle. So that's what I did. So now we're going to go back to the beginning of the story. I already mentioned what made it so wicked here, that we were a gateway and we had diversity. But even before the Europeans came to America, the natives were here. And I have a lot of friends who are native, and I love them to pieces. And I'm not saying this to belittle anybody, but the natives had their struggles too. And they had their conflicts too. And they had conflicts with each other. Uh -huh. In Legends, Lore, and Secrets of Western New York, I mentioned that the earliest natives here in Western New York were actually the Erie's people. Uh -huh which gave the Lake Erie its name. They were called the cat people by the French because they wore the skins of lions, cats, probably mountain lions. They were supplanted by the Seneca. So when the Seneca and other natives came to this area, the Erie's people were assimilated, integrated, killed, or pushed away. And so there are no more Erie's people. But almost every Seneca native can trace their lineage back to someone who was Erie's, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So there was that kind of conflict. And you know, it wasn't, it wasn't out of hatred for the other. It was usually territorial. So during the early days when the French were the first white men here in the region, we had the Beaver Wars. And I don't know how far east the Beaver Wars went, but I do know that they were in western New York. And the Beaver Wars were caused by greed, basically. Um, there was a great market for beaver pelts in Europe. And the white traders here um, were trapping the beaver for their pelts. Well, they partnered with the Indians, if you could call it partnering. Because the natives knew where the hunting grounds were. They knew how to trap the beaver, and they knew the territories. So European, and so there were a lot of, um, uh, there was a lot of fighting or competition over the beaver and the money that was being paid, which I'm sure was not very much. Uh, not at this end, where they were trapping them. Well, when the Europeans came, they brought with them their idea of land ownership. So as a European or an early American, uh, I settle on this land, this is my land. I build a house on this land, this is my house. These are my cows. I don't want my cows wandering, so I'm going to build a fence around my land. This was contrary to the way the natives viewed land ownership. For them, it was communal. Not one man's property. It was communal. And it was all about sustenance. 
they're water, they're farming, they're hunting, they relied on that land for their food and their survival. So if you build a fence around that land, how can, how can that wildlife follow its food source? How can a native follow his food source? And that was a problem. So fences were being torn down and then anger, you know, over that was my fence, why did you tear it down? Not your land, yes it is my land. So you see this conflict. And the other part of that was, and this goes back to the beaver trapping and that, the, the white settlers or the trappers, it was dangerous for them to cross into someone's territory unknown. So that territory, as I said, that was hunting ground. You had so many people living in that land, and that land had to feed them. The, it was the equivalent when you cross someone's territory without permission, and then you take their beaver, or their deer, or their anything, that's the equivalent of taking food out of someone else's mouth. So there was a lot of conflict over that, and that was the beaver wars. And then, of course, the ground of Western Europe was blood-soaked with the War of 1812, or what some people call the Second War for Independence. But I'm not going to talk about that right now. I will come back and talk about that. What I would like to do <clears throat> is share with you a story of someone whose name kept cropping up in my research and fascinated me to the point I could not leave him out of my book. And that is the Great Red Jacket. So if I said to you Cochise or Sitting Bull, if you were interested in Native stories, anywhere in this country you probably would have heard those names. I wonder how many people out West know the story, know the, the name Red Jacket. What's the name? Red Jacket. You know, Red. I, what was that? <laughs> I did not Yeah, you know, I did not know Red Jacket until I came oh, to what, until I came to Western New York. So I grew up in Corning Painted Post, and we didn't have stories about Red Jacket there. So every school child here should know the name Red Jacket. If they don't, they need me to come and tell them, because they should know, they should know. He was a chief, a sachem, and an orator, a great orator. I liken him to the, the orators of ancient Greece. And even his contemporaries, whites and natives, said that he was a great speaker. His words could change hearts and minds. That meant he had influence. And with influence comes responsibility. And you also set yourself up for rivalries. And the natives were not without their rivalries. Red Jacket's main <coughs> goal throughout his life was the survival of his nation. And I think in all of the little stories I'm going to tell you about Red Jacket, you can see that his number one goal was the survival of his nation. The Seneca, <clears throat> or I'm going to have to read this, Onandawaga. I may not have the emphasis, Onandawaga. That is their Indian name, and it means people of the great hill. They come from the Canandaigua Lake region, and there is a hill at the end of Canandaigua Lake that you can read about in my book, Native American and Pioneer Sites of Above State New York. Commercial! <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that, that, was, that was Red Jacket's people. And they were part of the Iroquois the Confederacy. The Iroquois is the way that the French pronounced Iroquois, and um, it is an, a white name for them. Their Indian name is the Haudenosaunee. The Iroquois were the Haudenosaunee. Well, Red Jacket got his name from the coat that he wore. And he wore it proudly any time he had a portrait done. You will see him wearing that Red Jacket. 
It was given to him by a British officer for being a messenger during the Revolutionary War. And, but that is not his, that is his, his white man's name, Red Jacket. His real name is Sagoyawatha. I hope Red Jacket will forgive me if I say that wrong. I feel like my GPS. She always says, turn left on the Skachaquada. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she says. Turn left on the Skachaquada. When really she means the Skajak. Yeah. So, Sagoyawatha. And that name means he who causes others to be awake. That was the name that he got when he became an orator. To speak well means that you can awaken others. That's a lot of power. I got it, it got him into trouble. He was a messenger, not a warrior. A lover, not a fighter, right? But really, he was a messenger. And his, he was, in a way, a prophet. He would have dreams and visions. Um, he really advised his people to be neutral during the Revolutionary War. He said, don't take sides with the white men. It's the white men's problem. It's their war. But you see, what happened, and this will come back later when, when I do talk very briefly about the War of 1812, the British convinced the natives that they were brothers to the British under the great white father, the king, across the sea, right? And there were natives who did not want to take sides. They wanted to remain neutral. There were natives who did not believe that they were brothers to the British. So what happened with the Revolutionary War is it was very much like a civil war for the Indians. The Mohawk and the Senecas found themselves facing off against the Oneida and the Tuscarora. They're brothers in the Confederacy. They were, they had a peace treaty with each other. They had a, a covenant promise not to fight each other. And here they were thrown into it against each other. And during the Revolutionary War, I think it was the Oneida attacked a Mohawk village. The Mohawk then retaliated and attacked an Oneida village. And this is what happened. So when the battle, you know, as I said, Red Jacket said, don't do this. Don't take sides. The Battle of Oriskany and the massacre at Cherry Valley, uh, Red Jacket was there at both of those, but he didn't fight. He walked away. And this got him in trouble with Corn Planter and Handsome Lake. Corn Planter was a war chief. Handsome Lake was a chief and also a prophet. And so I think there was also a little rivalry over my prophecy says this and your prophecy says that. I mean, we don't know. But that's what I know people. And I think that's what happened there. And they branded Red Jacket a coward for walking away from those battles. He is said to have said, it's too late to fight. And he walked away. We don't know what he meant. Was it too late in the year to fight? Or maybe what he was saying, it's too late to win this battle. Maybe he knew that his people were destined to lose because he had a dream. So Brandon a coward, this great speaker, uh, trying to convince his people to remain neutral. It must have been extremely frustrating for him. He was also always fighting against the missionaries who were trying to convert the natives to Christianity. And his reason was that every time they became Christianized, they left their traditions behind. You know, I have to wonder, is it possible to have both? You know, but he wouldn't let, 
He didn't like the missionaries turning his people away from their native ways, from their traditional ways, and I can understand that. His, he married a Christian woman, or she was Christianized after they were married, but Red Jacket remained unconverted throughout his life. At one point, he even told the missionaries, don't be telling us what we're doing bad and how sinful we are. Tend to the people of Buffalo who are cheating us. <clears throat> so, wicked. Wicked, wicked, wicked. I mentioned uh, the War of 1812, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because it's a, you know, it's, that would be a topic unto itself. But during that war, Red Jacket and his people actually allied with the Americans in that war. And Red Jacket did not seem to have tried to convince them otherwise. So it goes back to that, I, that idea that <clears throat> the red man was brother to the white man under the great white father, the king across the sea. And after the Revolutionary War, the natives who had sided with the British, most of them were forced out of the region many of them to Canada, and some chose to go to Canada. That meant they were still British. Those who remained here were now American. So when the War of 1812 broke out, those who were still British fought for the British in Canada. Those who were American had become friends and had made a new covenant. So there was um, a wampum called the Covenant Chain Wampum. Mm -hmm. And the king in Britain used that against the Indians all the time. We have this agreement. We have this agreement. Um, and so they still had that agreement, those natives that went to Canada. But here in, the, in, in what became the United States, they had formed a new agreement, a new covenant with the Americans. They were no longer colonists, children of the great white father by way of war, right? So that is why they sided with the Americans. Oh, what a mess, right? What a mess. Why was Red Jacket accused of witchcraft. <laughs> well, here we go back to that rivalry. You know, any opportunity to bring the other guy down, right? It was, now this is where the Holland Land Office comes into the story. 1792, 1793, Robert Morris. Robert Morris was the wealthiest man in America and one of the financiers of the War for Independence. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. And he bought land from Massachusetts that we now call Western New York. And the Holland Land Company bought it. But they couldn't take possession of it because the natives still said that they owned it. Now, I don't know if it was that they couldn't take possession of it. I do know that the Holland Land Company could not buy the land directly from New York State because they were a foreign entity. They were Dutch. They had to get it through an agent, and that was Robert Morris. I don't know if the Holland Land Company, and maybe you know and you can share this, said, no, we're not going to fight with the Indians over this. You get them to give it up first or if they just had a law that said they couldn't. Um, but it was several years before they could actually take possession of that land that they had purchased. I found conflicting stories, as I always do when I'm doing my research. Uh, some stories said Robert Morris met with the, with the natives, and other ones said his son Thomas met with the natives, and what I had heard in that case was that Robert Morris was ill and couldn't go. So his son Thomas went to the meeting, the, the council at Big Tree 
in Geneseo. On the Genesee River, it was called Big Tree for all of the large oak trees that grew there. And it was at that treaty that the natives finally gave up that land. Um, there were thousands of representatives from the native community there, including Mary Jemison. She was a major landowner in the sense that they owned land, right? And Red Jacket. And Red Jacket, again, spoke. He's, I'm going to read this quote that I found because I just love this. We are much disturbed in our dreams about the great eater with the big belly endeavoring to devour our lands. Mm -hmm. So this shows you how he was having these dreams and images, visions. And he told his people, don't sell the land. In the end, and again, conflicting information, but it is my choice as a storyteller to tell you this story, that Thomas Morris, or someone um, in charge, plied the native women with free alcohol, free liquor, and free trinkets. <clears throat> now, we call them trinkets, but if you think about it, they were probably beads, and beads were quite often made from shell that came from somewhere else. And the native women weren't going to go travel to that place to get those beads. They may have had little metal jangles and bangles that they sewed on their clothing. That had to be made. Blankets. Did you ever do any weaving, ladies? Did you ever do any spinning? I spin yarn. I've never managed to weave very much. I've been working on a sweater. I have, a sw I have this much of it done. And it took me all winter. You know, so that was, that represented, those things represented a lot of time. And time is money, time is worth something. So the, the women of the Haudenosaunee are very much equal to the men, you know, the, you enter the female's family and take the female name. You enter her clan, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And she is the one, the women choose the chiefs. They can own land, look at Mary Jemison. They can own land and property. So they had a lot of influence. Get them drunk and give them pretty things, right? In the end, $100,000 for 3.5 million acres of land. $100,000 doesn't seem like a lot, but I think it's an equivalent of, I read like $5 million these days. And I think it was put into some kind of uh, trust to help it grow for the natives, <coughs> but I'm sure that the land was worth a whole lot more than what they got for it. And Red Jacket, with all of his power, as a great speaker, was not able to change their minds. So, he must be a sorcerer, because he couldn't do the right thing. He must be a sorcerer because he probably caused everything to go wrong. Yeah. So comes the trial of Red Jacket. Was there really such a trial? It was never written down, but I'm a storyteller. And I come from the tradition of telling the truth through story. And a long time ago, and especially among the native peoples, before people could read and write, how do you suppose the news traveled? <coughs> how do you suppose the culture was kept? Right? So word of mouth says that there was a trial. Um, I believe it was 1801. And uh, Red Jacket was on trial for his life. So sorcery was a little bit different among the natives than it would have been witchcraft among the Europeans. But it still was punishable by death. <coughs> so Red Jacket was on trial for his life. Many natives were there, were present. 
And he spoke for three hours on his own behalf. And you know what? He was acquitted. He was a great warrior. <coughs> or maybe he was a sorcerer. I don't know. Um, John Mick Stanley was an artist who was born in Canandaigua. Therefore, he would have grown up with all of the stories about the Seneca people, because that is where they were from. And uh, he moved to Buffalo for a short time. In 1863, no, 1862 to 1868, he painted a beautiful painting called The Trial of Red Jacket. Huge, huge painting. And I was very fortunate when I was writing this book to have gone to the Historical Society in Buffalo at a time when they had that painting on display, as it would have been during the Age of Spectacle. So we come back to the Age of Spectacle, from Thomas Barnett and his museum to William, to John Mix, or Henry Mix Stanley, who, uh, I'm sorry, John Mix Stanley, getting my Henry's and my John's all mixed up, John Mix Stanley, and another, at the same time, Age of Spectacle. People were paying pennies to go in and see his painting. It was on display with footlights and velvet curtains. People learned about the natives in America that way. And what's interesting about that painting is that John Mick Stanley did not paint all the natives as Seneca, although they would have, the Iroquois would have been the only natives present at that meeting at that trial. He painted natives from all around the country. Because he had traveled out west, and this was not only a way for him to show his painting and make a little bit of money, but it was a way for him to show his knowledge of the native people. So by viewing that painting, people were learning all kinds of things that they couldn't learn otherwise. He also put a portrait of himself and Revelyn Kirkland in the painting, though they probably they would not have been present. Um, and uh, Rev Reverend Kirkland was a missionary to the natives. So if you look at that painting, you'll see a couple of white men standing in the background there. Um, so that is, uh, now a little more knowledge about the Trial of Red Jacket painting. When I was asked to come and do this talk, I asked myself a lot of questions. So I had to do a lot of additional research to put this program together because I have this is the first time I have done this particular presentation. So I thank you very much for challenging me to do that. But I, I called the Buffalo um, History Museum because I had done a Google search and found the painting in the possession of the Smithsonian Institution. But the Buffalo Historical Society told me it was in Buffalo. So when I called Buffalo, they said, yes, it is in our possession. It is in storage. Uh, I think they told me this year they're going to be bringing it out again on view. Um, I was not able to reach anybody at the Smithsonian. I had to send them a message through email. And the other day, I couldn't call the Buffalo Museum again because they were closed that day. So I can't tell you if there's two copies. The Smithsonian says the one they have was given to them by a relative of John McStanley. So he may have painted a couple of them. It might be, there might be forgeries out there. I don't know. It's a very interesting question. It's a little mystery to solve. So, um, and the people at the Buffalo Historical Society didn't know anything about the one at the Smithsonian. I might have to do a little more exploring to find that out. Red Jacket's death. So, this great chief, this orator, branded a coward, accused of witchcraft, acquitted, pretty much died alone in his little cabin at Buffalo Creek Reservation. When he was buried, 
He was buried without a headstone. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. When he died, he said, I want to be buried in my regalia as is fitting for a native to be buried. He said, the white men will come to take my body. Don't let them have me. The missionaries took his body and buried him in the churchyard on the reservation. Gave him no headstone. He had no headstone. In 1839, uh, a comedian and actor who was very well known, Henri Placide, had come to Buffalo to perform. And he heard the story of Red Jacket. And he was dismayed by the neglect of the burial site. I guess he was a kindred spirit because he was an actor. He was a speaker. He could paint pictures with words. And here you had this grand native man who was a great orator buried in a neglected grave without a headstone. So Henry Placide took up a collection and bought a headstone for him, which I think is wonderful. Little by little, though, people visiting the grave took away at that headstone and took pieces of it as a souvenir. You see that all the time. I have a stone. Don't tell the people in charge, but I have a stone from the ancient wall of Troy. I wasn't supposed to take it. I know this is on a film, but what can I say? I had to have it. It was um, 1842 that, so, uh, we think that Red Jacket died in 1830, but you know, records were not kept the way they are today. So 12 years later, the reservation was disbanded as a reservation. And that meant that they were able to bury some white people in that cemetery. And little by little, the population encroached on that land. Um, in 1851, Charles Clark, one of the early um, owners, and that's probably not the right word that I want, of Forest Lawn Cemetery, um, proposed that the natives from the Buffalo Creek Reservation Cemetery be brought to Forest Lawn Cemetery. Some people think that he probably did that so he could have a celebrity burial and sell more plots that way. That's wicked. What can I say? It was wicked. Um, it took quite a few years. It took 30 more years before they actually did move the bodies into Forest Lawn. And today, you can go and see the statue and all the burials there. Now, for a little wicked story, a little sinister story, to go with the burial of Red Jacket. And I just love all of his stories so much. When they went to get him from the grave, he wasn't there. <laughs> the sorcerer, right? <laughs> Remember, he said, the white men will come from my body. Don't let them take me. Look, his prophecy came true. Supposedly, many natives who were loyal to Red Jacket passed his body from home to home and kept it hidden. It finally came to the home of Ruth Stevenson. She was the daughter of a war chief. She hid it in an undisclosed place. Buried it probably somewhere. But she was getting older. And she was worried that she would die and no one would ever know where Red Jacket was, was buried. So she gave him up. She gave him up and he was able to be buried with great ceremony um, at Forest Lawn Cemetery. And they had a great procession and all of this for the bodies. There's one more wicked story to go with that. The, this legend is that the, there was plaster stuck to the bones, stuck to Red Jacket's bones. Why? It was the age of spectacle. Somebody tried to make a plaster cast of the great man so they could put him on display. Mm. Ah, so, <laughs> I love it. 
How are we doing on time there, sir? Where are we? We just did an hour. We're just at an hour? Yeah. All right. I'm going to end here so that I don't bore you to tears. Oh, yeah. no more. 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 I'm going to end here with just some a couple little snippets, all right? I won't tell the whole stories because you can read about them. Um, here in Buffalo, we had draft riots during the Civil War in 1863, two weeks before the great draft riot of New York City. And, you know, I finally got to watch the movie Streets of New York, or Gangs of New York. Has anybody seen that? I was so eager to see that movie because of the draft riots. I wanted to, to see that. Most of the movie was about street gangs, and then at the end of the movie, they got into the draft riots. But, you know, here in Buffalo, we had a large Irish population at the time. And um, the draft riots in Mr. Lincoln's war was not originally about slavery. It was about the South wanting their rights under the Constitution. They wanted to own slaves. And the whole thing could have been addressed during the Revolutionary period or during the early period, but it wasn't. So, um, uh, it, they, nobody really expected the war over states' rights to last very long. You know about the Battle of Manassas. Well, people thought it was a picnic. I mean, they took their picnic baskets out and the ladies in their fine dresses with their parasols and they set up and they had their picnics right on the edge of the battlefield, which was fine until the battle started and horses ran, you know, through their picnic ground and bodies were falling dead everywhere. And they realized, this is no picnic. <laughs> this is horrible. There's blood. There's death. There's destruction. So the war was going on. It was two years into the war with no end in sight. And men didn't want to fight and die over states' rights in the South. Mr. Lincoln made it about slavery. And in a way, it was about slavery. And that encouraged more people to get involved. But it still wasn't enough, so he instituted the draft. Well, for the sum of $300, if you had $300, which was a lot of money at that time, you could pay somebody else to go and fight in your behalf. And many wealthy people did that. Grover Cleveland did that. I think it was one of the Rockefellers did that. Paid someone else to go and fight for them. A lot of brothers did it. Hmm? A lot of brothers did it. Your brothers did that? Yeah. I mean, and oh, Yeah, brothers, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah? Wow. And so what that meant was that it was more likely that if you were poor and a laborer that you were going to be drafted. So the laborers went on strike. But this was the time of the Industrial Revolution, and business in Buffalo was booming. You had the grain mills, and you had the, the foundries, and you had a lot of business, right? A lot of money flowing. The bosses had to keep the industry moving, so what do they do? The higher scouts. And who are the most likely people to take those jobs? The escaped slaves and freed slaves who settled in Buffalo. In the Union Block, or the Negro Block of Buffalo, which was the Canal District. And so, when the riots began in, in 1863, it was in July and August, mobs of angry workers took to the streets, and woe to anyone who got in their way. And if you were a black man, you were grabbed, and you were beaten, and you were killed. The draft office was burned. The mayor's house was ransacked and looted. The mob was on its way to the Negro block, where the black entrepreneurs had their businesses and where black families lived, and they were going to burn it. Because these people were making it so that they would have to be drafted. Well, long and short, it didn't get as bad, bad as it 
was in New York City two weeks later. But there were still deaths, and there was still a lot of destruction, and people got arrested. And that's pretty wicked, too. Pretty wicked. I think that is all that I had for you. But let me just, let me just quickly check my notes. Yes, she doesn't do stand-up comedy. I don't know. <laughs> Um, I think that that's where I'm going to stop because I don't want to bore you to tears, like I you said. But you can learn about if you can learn about one more story, and I'm not going to tell you this story, but you can learn about it a little bit in my book. My book is written so you can. There's always more you can learn if you do extra research. But there was a name, Andre Marchand, mm -hmm. and I love this this man. Well, I don't really love him because he was a philanderer. But he came over from Europe. He was an artist. And he ended up in Buffalo. Uh, he was a very well-known dioramic artist. Mm -hmm. He ended up doing dioramas for the Buffalo Museum of Science, along with his two older sons, who did a lot of the wax sculptures that were there for years. Mm -hmm. His wife was murdered. And it was all about jealousy, because he had an affair with a native woman. So there, you can, you can go and look that one up. <laughs> but, you know, we may be wicked, but we're wonderful, right? Thank you. Thank you very much.